Hello again internet friends, we're going to do a slightly different video today. A lot of feedback on Twitter from folks who said that the colour calibration of Sony PVMs and broadcast monitors is pretty cool, but not everybody has Sony PVMs and broadcast monitors. A lot of people using just regular old uh, domestic televisions, which is also cool. So. Uh, a lot of the tools that we've been using have shown us how to calibrate pretty expensive displays with lots and lots and lots of tweaks. If you're lucky enough to know the, the magic um, combination on your remote control to get you into your menus on your, on your domestic television and change your RGB, that's pretty cool. I, however, have uh, this really cheap and pretty awful um, no name brand television that I bought a long time ago, brand new. It's a uh, 30, 31 inch, 80 centimeter or so CRT. Uh, pretty terrible picture quality, but I love it to bits. Um, I play all my old games on it because it's huge and bright. Um, but sometimes it leaves me wondering whether or not the picture's pretty accurate. So, what we can do is we can look at some of the techniques we've learnt up to date in the previous videos on how to calibrate the expensive displays to find settings that are, I won't say good, uh, but I will say less terrible than the defaults. So this particular TV, um, now I apologize in advance, I'm, I'm running, I'm in a PAL territory, I've got a 50 hertz TV, so hopefully my uh, crappy webcam isn't going to just make this flicker like hell, probably will, um, but when we get to the calibration videos, which are uh, NTSC videos, 60 hertz, we'll see. But uh, right now, I've got my trusty PlayStation 3 hooked up just via composite. Um, so no no super duper RGB or um, component uh, YPRPB type, YPBPR type connections, uh, just crappy old composite. Um, and there's, there's a few features about composite, which we'll see later in the video. Uh, which is why I'm I'm choosing to do this way. This this is likely if you've got an old Nintendo NES or something that only has that option, and you haven't RGB modded modded the console, then this is probably the way you're going to be viewing it. So it's a good little test. Um, going through the menus here, um, like I really don't have a lot of features. I, I can choose my color mode, which is literally just my territory, my PAL or NTSC. Um, so if I set that to auto, it's just going to pick PAL, which is kind of cool. Um, I've got this menu here with sort of brightness, contrast, color, sharpness, and tint. And tint at the moment isn't selectable. Uh, and we'll see why in a sec when we look at the calibration disk a little bit later. Um, but the other one that we have is this menu, my WB, white balance. Um, I can choose uh, norm, normal. Okay, oh, what have I done? There we go. I can choose... Uh, two levels of cool, or I can choose two levels of warm, uh, which is great, but what's accurate and what's not, I have no idea. Um, so, I guess we should find out. So, if we head to our trusty Color HCFR software that we've been using for a while now, and we fire up a new uh, calibration session on that, and we've always been using this automatic generator for the for all our test patterns and that's been generated out of the HDMI port of my laptop through some sort of converter into my screen. There's plenty of other ways to do that. Um, there's a really cool automated Raspberry Pi method that I'll be covering in a later video that I really want to share with you all. I think it's a, a really great little project. Um, but the other thing you can do is if you've got a, a special disc of any description, DVD, Blu-ray, and that disc has got test patterns on it that are specifically matched to the software, you can manually use the disc and flick through the menus to generate test patterns for your screen. So we're going to do that today. Um, and the particular DVD, so I'm going to use my x right Color Monkey that I've been using the whole way. Um, I have a refresh based display because it's a CRT, so it refreshes. Uh, and I'm going to leave everything else as default. And here we have our familiar screen that we've been using for a while now. Now, on my uh, PlayStation 3 console, I have downloaded the AVS HD 709 test calibration disc. I'll put a link in the description for you to grab. That disc 
is, uh, I'll just go over to it here. It's actually, I've downloaded the DVD version. Now it's not a DVD. So DVD is MPEG-2 format internally, um, despite the fact that this is on a DVD uh, media, it is not DVD encoded. It's actually Blu-ray encoded. Now, um, pros and cons here. Uh, this is a 709 disc, so I've, I've talked in the theory video about the different color gamuts and the different standards. I've hinted at it a little bit in some of the other videos how we're always calibrating to 709 because um, it, it's sort of a, a new standard, it's easy to get media for. So again, we're going to calibrate to 709 today. I'm working on a disc that I'll hopefully release soon, which has got uh, two different Rec. 601 calibration levels. Um, they were different for NTSC and PAL regions uh, because of different line counts making different brightnesses and things like that. So um, I'll, I'll talk more about that in a later uh, episode. But for now, we're just going to use this device. So again, it is internally, it is uh, Blu-ray, so uh, H.264, I guess. I haven't looked at the media. I'm assuming it's H.264 um, media internally. It just happens to be burnt to a DVD disc. So if you put this disc into a DVD player, it won't work. If you put this disc into a Blu-ray player or anything that's compatible with Blu-ray, it likely will work. Um, the link that I give you, it'll talk about it. There's there's two different downloads. There's a Blu-ray media one and a DVD media one. DVD media one's nice because DVD burners are super cheap. Like they're you pick them up out of the trash just about these days. Um, this particular PlayStation 3 has actually been modded and I've just copied the DVD ISO to the hard drive, which means it's just loaded up in there, which is nice and handy. So let's fire this up and have a look what it looks like. Hopefully it doesn't resume from where I was last and just goes to the menu. Beautiful. Okay, so this is the AVS HD menu. So uh, it is a... Um, it is a 60 hertz disc, so basically an NTSC disc. It is also widescreen, so you see I'm on my 4 is the 3 CRT here, um, and the uh, aspect ratio is out a bit. I've got some stuff cut off the sides, and I've got black bars, but that's okay. Um, won't affect what we're trying to do today. So we've got a couple of basic settings and things up here that we can look at. If we go into basic settings, We've got a, uh, a nice pluge ramp. Um, I don't know how well the camera picks this up, and I don't know if I can even exaggerate. So um, if I look at my brightness here, oh, this is another terrible thing about this TV. When I bring up my, my, my um, configuration menu here, it covers my picture, which is absolutely useless. I hate it. Um, but anyway, this is my, my black ramp. Um, at the moment, to my eyes, the whole thing looks black, which means that the default brightness setting, so remember we talked about this, brightness is are your uh, your black levels, the darker end of the color spectrum, and your contrast are your white levels, your higher end of the of the uh, or the luminance, I should say, not the color spectrum, the luminance. Um, so these black levels are all crushed here, i.e., um, everything from. So we have a, a concept of what we call reference black, which is the lowest legal black level for broadcast television, um, and that should be black 16. And in fact, you'll see that when I, hopefully, the uh, camera will pick it up when I turn this on you'll see that everything below 16 just doesn't show. If you've got a full range monitor, like a PC monitor hooked up to uh, VGA or HDMI and it's sending full range video, or you've got a, a nice uh, fancy new OLED TV, you can actually see these colors below. Um, and, but what you should do is you should calibrate your TV so that with your black level so that 16 is the lowest visible. So we'll quickly see if we can sort of exaggerate that now. If I turn this all the way up to its highest setting, I don't know if the camera We'll pick this up or not. Hopefully it will. Sort of does, but um, what you can see is that even though this, uh, well, what I can see with my eyes, is even though that 17 is quite visible, 16 is what we call reference black. Everything below 16 is just gone, even though my black levels over here are clearly grey because I've turned the brightness up too high. So we call this um, crushing, um, and, and this is just nature of uh, the... Uh, PlayStation 3 sending limited range video and it's not processing those levels below that. So this is kind of useless to us to try and calibrate here. Um, if you're using something like Artemio's uh, 240p test suite, you can use the pluge patterns in there to do this and, and calibrate your black levels, which is kind of cool. But anyway, that's, that's that. I'm going to turn this back down to 50%. A little bit more. Wrong controller, work with me. There we go. 
so back to defaults, um, which is pretty terrible. Anyway, back to the top level menu. So there's a Blu-ray disc, it's got nice menus in it. Uh, you'll see three settings over here. On the on the left, we've got, uh, you can't see it because it's kind of cut off, it says Calman. Uh, so that's a commercial calibration software product, um, which is uh, very expensive, but very good. Uh, Chroma Pure, which I think is another uh, commercial one. Um, and of course, Color HCFR, which is what we've been using uh, this whole time. And I'm a big fan of, it's open source, it's free. It's got an excellent community behind it. They've got forums and things you can chat on and talk to people. Very, very friendly folks, very smart folks. Um, very willing to share information with everybody, which uh, is my kind of jam. So, let's go over to the Color H. CFR, and they've got a couple of different options on the right here. I don't know if you can see it. This one says APL, this one says Fields, this one says Windows. Um, so the the uh, patterns here you can look at. They've all got all sorts of patterns you can uh, play with that do different colours in comparison with each other. Um, you can often, if your if your monitor has one of those blue only buttons where it only shows the blue channel, or if you've got a blue film that you can put over your eyes to, to gauge colours, you know, you can use those sorts of things. I might cover those in a later video, but today we're going to concentrate on the old uh, colour monkey that's right in the middle of my screen here. Uh, go back to the top level. Uh, you've got uh, fields, which give you your colour fields. So, for example, if I go to my 100% colour fields, um, this is obviously 100% red, and I can hit my R1 button on my PlayStation controller, which is the same as Next Chapter. And that takes me to... Uh, the different colours and cycle through, and it gives me a nice little number down here to tell me uh, what percentage it is, which obviously is quite obvious when we're in the primary colours, but later on when we do saturations, we'll see those percentages change. So that's kind of cool too. However, don't calibrate like this. Don't calibrate with full windows, and the reason for that is if your brightness is up too high on full windows, it can actually affect your geometry. You can get quite a bit of blowout, the picture can warp, uh, all sorts of terrible things. On this particular screen that I'm trying to calibrate here today, if I do 100% uh, blue like I am now, the brightness drops, um, which I, I think is probably not a healthy thing for the screen. Um, I, I don't think that's an automatic feature, I think that's just a bit of over voltage happening somewhere, which is kind of scary. Um, I see it a lot when I'm playing like Final Fantasy type games and there's a blue menu that comes up with text, um, it's pretty terrible. So don't do this. Instead, uh, if we go back to the main menu, look at these window options. And these are much better, right? So we're going to look at these options where we have our uh, colour in a nice little window. And we're not going to get that blowout um, when we look at these, these bright colours as we go through these options here. So, uh, let's start from the start. Let's, now we're going, to, we're going to take a slightly different take on this this time. When we do our... Uh, we're not going to calibrate, obviously, because we can't. These these values are going to show us um, some pretty terrible delays. In fact, you know, uh, why not? Let's let's just do one just to prove the point. So uh, on my uh, DVD, I go over here to my grayscale, uh, and I go hit the go button, and I'm going to get black. Now you get about a minute or two of a particular color, which is plenty of time. If I hit the ca the measure grayscale in my window, and I say yes. And it says, all right, set uh, chapter 0% grey, and then click OK. So that's what I'm on now, so I'm just going to hit Enter on my keyboard, or click OK, same difference. It's going to try and read black, and it's going to take quite a while. Um, so we've discussed this before, the darker colours, fewer photons hitting the sensor. The sensor has to, to sample more in order to get information, and if it's pure black, like an OLED or a CRT, where there is uh, nothing coming through, um, on certain sensors it can actually fail and get no reading, which mine does, but happily moves on. So it says, go to 10% grey. So I've got to hit next chapter. Up comes 10% grey. I'm not sure if you can see that on the camera or not. Uh, there is a grey this square there. You'll probably see, depending on uh, how terrible my camera is, you'll probably see things a little bit later. 20% grey. So again, next chapter. Okay. So this process is quite tedious. And what I'm going to do is, for the first one, I'll, I'll show you. I'll go through this process. All right, 60%. Okay. But what I'm going to do from uh, after this is I'll, I'll quick cut through all these because nobody wants to watch a video of me cycling through endless um, chapters on DVDs. 
obviously if you've got some sort of automated test pattern generator that is so much faster than this but this is a, a great low cost option uh, grand total cost of you know whatever a blank disk uh, costs me Radio. So, we talked in previous videos about this delta E uh, value, right? Which was the the um, error of how far off we should be uh, from a given color. So, uh, we're calibrating to rec 709. Apologies for the quick cut, folks. I had my settings wrong, so I've just reset this to uh, rec 709, and I've rerun my grayscale now. We talked in previous videos about this delta E component across this uh, row here, uh, and we said that delta E 2.0 is what we consider the uh, the maximum acceptable value. Anything over 2.0 is definitely human noticeable. Um, so we're seeing a lot of values here that are quite shocking, right? We're in the the tens, um, and if you look at these sorts of levels here across any colour, so if I pick a 50%, for example. Um, we see that my red is way too low, my green is too high, my blue is way too high. And I've talked about this in previous videos where a lot of screens are far too heavy on the blues and the greens because uh, we perceive that, and we, we talked about this in the theory video, we perceive that as extra brightness or extra detail. And that makes us think that a picture is more detailed or sharper. Um, so it's a common sales strategy to push televisions with higher blues than reds to give off an illusion of, of a, a bright or saturated picture that makes colours look better. So it works out on the showroom floor when they're trying to sell TVs, but uh, when it comes to actual critical viewing and, and um, really comfortable viewing too, when I'm in my fairly darkish games room and I want to play something and, and watch it quite comfortably, these extra blues and extra greens coming out of my uh, white colours uh, are really too bright. They just hurt my eyes. I'm actually staring at this calibration pattern right now quite painfully. So uh, what can we do about that? Well, because we don't have RGB controls on this monitor, mucking around in this menu really doesn't help us. Um, what we can do, however, is we can go and look at different graphs that we've got here and measure off those graphs. And I think that's a better way when you're looking at a domestic television where you don't have fine grain controls. Uh, you can look at these different graphs and go through and see what we've got. So this is our luminance graph. We talked about this before. So we go from uh, our darker shades to our lighter shades and we see the relative luminance of each channel. So uh, yellow is our average, I believe. That's our average luminance or our, our overall luminance. And then we have individual channels, red, green, and blue. And we can see that as we go from dark to light, they diverge quite a bit in our bright colors. Our blues are way too high and our reds are way too low. Likewise, if we look at other graphs, we look at our um, RGB levels. Uh, we can see they're all over the shop. This is just awful, awful. So, the, you know, default settings on this very cheap television. Um, you know, when we looked at our PVM, we got nice straight lines. We got all these within a couple of, um, you know, a couple of percent of each other. Our pink line here is our delta E or our error. Um, and we had that sort of, you know, floating below two when we calibrated our PVM in, in the first few videos, which is great. So looking some more, uh, where are we? This is our RGB levels, a uh, color temperature, right. So we spoke about color temperature and we spoke about our white point. Uh, and we said that for Rec. 709 and, and for most of our common, so um, sRGB on PC, Adobe RGB, uh, Rec. 601, Rec. 709, they all expect a white point along here, along the 6500 line. And we see our white point is way up high, way up high. So um, I guess the first thing we can do when we're looking at a, a screen like this and we want to try and get everything in a ballpark, um, and we'll, we'll look at some other things later on, we'll look at our gamma levels too, like our gamma graph is just shocking. We just collapse off the end here, um, which is, is really terrible. Uh, we want a gamma of around 2.2 for a CRT. Uh, 2.4 isn't bad if you're watching um, like an OLED or an LCD television in a bright room. Um, so say, you know, it's, it's daytime and you're watching daytime TV, you sort of, you want a gamma of 2.4 and you want a nice straight line along here. Now note, 
when we talk about gamma, I say straight line. Um, that is the gamma of each point mapped um, across this graph here. Gamma itself, they'll, they'll talk about the gamma curve. Um, so if you're using something like Kalman, gamma on that is represented on a curved graph, um, and they'll give you the points that you're supposed to hit on that graph. But they, they represent it here as a straight line, um, and we're going for gamma 2, 2. That's, our, that's what we're trying to get to, uh, and you can see that these gamma marks are, are way off the line there. Um, I think this is this white line is our is it our average or our reference? That's our reference, and our yellow is our average. So that's that's pretty terrible. Anyway, let's go back to our color temperature, and we're going to we're going to tackle this one first because uh, it's probably going to be the easiest of the lot. Uh, and I say that because if I go into my menus here. I've got this overall white balance, uh, which I can set to um, warmer or cooler. Um, now on my on my graph here, cooler colors are higher temperatures, uh, which is kind of uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. But <laughs> these these uh, higher temperatures go bluer, and these lower temperatures go redder. So we call these warm, and we call these cool. Um, so we're too cool at the moment. We're up in the nine thousands. Uh, now, there's some argument to be made for this. Um, there was a time in uh, Japanese broadcast where uh, around 9,000 Kelvin uh, was the white point. I think it's 9,300 was the white point that they used for a while on Japanese broadcast. So you, you could argue the fact that if you were, you know, if you were playing Japanese video games, that's possibly what a, a Japanese video game developer would have been looking at and considered white. Um, so when, when they're basing that as their average colour temperature, then of course that's going to affect all the colours uh, around the white point, because everything's mapped from that point out to the extremes in our triangle. So that's when we, we look at our CIE graph here, CIE diagram. So at the moment, we, this is what we want, D65, this is what we want. We want a white point there, um, but our white point is actually this yellow dot here. Um, and all the dots around it, they're all the measurements that we took. I think this one's coloured yellow because we've highlighted that in our graph, but these are all the white points we took, and we can see that they're around 9300. So this television at its normal white levels calibrated for a 9300 white point, not a 6500 white point. So we want to shift that white point over here because this obviously is going to affect all these colours. If I did a colour map now, I'd see these colours flying off uh, into different areas, and this red especially would be pulled all the way over to the, to the blue here. Blue not, might not be shifted too far based on what colours this uh, screen can actually push out. But So we're going to try and pull this back. We're going to try and get to our 6500 level. Let's go back to our colour temperature graph. Very simple. We're just going to uh, set that to warm 1 and remeasure. Uh, actually, look, I'm not going to waste everybody's time. I know the answer to this. Uh, this actually warm 2. I've pre-measured this. I'm going to cheat a bit, is actually what we want to measure. So if we set this back to 0% black, we do our grey. And I'm going to leave it here. I'm not going to go back to the other screen. I'm going to leave it here so you can see what's going on. I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to just hit the enter button. So we're going to take the uh, black level reading, which won't give us anything, but we've got to do it. I'll actually quick cut to the end because this is really boring. So just a, qu a quick cut here. We're at the sort of 30-40% mark now, and we're already seeing these um, these white points come much closer into line. So we'll jump to the end. All right, so we're at the end here, um, and we can see that our white point now. Uh, has come much closer to the desired 6500 line. We're dipping a little bit at the high end, which probably means we're a little bit over um, into the uh, reddish tinge, which is not great. It'd um, be nice if that could stay a little bit more consistently. But we might play with the contrast and brightness and might actually fix that up. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Um, so now that we know that our colour temperature is sort of in the ballpark for what we expect and it's not floating way up here in the 9000s, that's what we want. Uh, next step is to look at the gamma. So um, on these sorts of TVs where we can't do a lot when it comes to our colour accuracy, I like to try and at least get my white point and my gamma right. If I can get those two things right, um, almost everything else can be eyeballed uh, outside of that to look pretty good. Uh, but they're sort of the important ones. 
Um, and again, now it, this is our gamma reading based on our most recent reading. We can just see our gamma just crashing off the end here. Um, now, what this tells me is that when my uh, gamma is too high here, I have to uh, raise that. So the, these, are, these are my dark levels, these are my light levels. So what I have to do is I have to raise my uh, dark levels to get the gamma to come down. And over here, I have to lower my white levels to get my gamma to come up. So I'm going to try and get this straighter. I'm going to try and get this across a straight line here. So I'm going to go to my picture and I'm going to, now I said I needed to, uh, I need to raise my brightness. I'm going to go to my picture. I'm going to raise my brightness up. I'm going to raise it up to about, I'll just raise it by 10, um, and I'm going to lower my contrast, which is my bright setting, by 10. Uh, and now again, I have to get rid of that because this is a terrible, terrible uh, display. And I will reread my grayscale. Okay, so I'm just at the halfway point here. I've pretty much everything on the left has been read, everything on the right we haven't read yet, so that's going to change. But we already noticed that just by raising our brightness, i.e. our dark levels, we've brought this gamma into line. So we're not sitting at these crazy uh, high points up here. Um, so we'll keep going. Right, so I'm almost at the end, uh, and I just want to point something out. It is, I have been a bit silly here. I've sort of jumped the gun. Uh, I'll read this 90 value, and then I'll read this 100 value. Now, uh, at first, it looks like these are flying off the charts, but this whole process is relative, so you really can't judge until the end. Right, now there is my new graph uh, of my gamma. So that was raising my... Uh, dark levels, lowering my white levels. And now we're, we're doing a lot better. So we want 2-2 two is what we actually want, uh, which is across this line here. Um, and now, like before, we were just sort of crashing on a diagonal, like we started all the way up here somewhere and then we we're down here. So we've improved quite a bit. There's still, I guess, more improvement we can do. Um, I'll probably be tempted to just uh, lower that contrast just a little bit more and rerun another one. So I'll do that. Gonna lower it to 35 and see where we land after that. Okay, so I've set my settings like so, uh, and this is the resulting graph that I've got over here. And again, not great. Uh, I can probably fiddle with this a bit more, uh, but I won't bore you guys with that. Um, but it, I just like to get that gamma just up a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm in a better spot now, um, even though we're sort of crashing a little bit at the end. We're not where we were before, where we had this sort of almost a, a diagonal ramp down there. Um, we, we'll try and fiddle a bit more to get that back up later on. Uh, but we'll move on for the sake of uh, making this video less boring. Uh, the next thing I want to look at are my colours. and. Uh, I can probably get a sense uh, just by measuring the primaries or where the primaries are, but I, I might not even do that. What I might do is look straight at the saturation points uh, and we'll map this on our CIE diagram. Um, so we talk about colour saturation and how saturated images are. What does that mean? Uh, on our CIE diagram, we've got our three points. We've got our green point, our blue point, and our red point. Now, these aren't measured. These are optimal. Uh, we'll see when we measure them. It'll start putting little uh, white and yellow dots all over this diagram. We'll see how far out they are. And it will draw a triangle for us once we've measured that. Actually, we'll, we'll do that right now. We'll, we'll measure our primaries. Uh, so in my menu, I go to my 100% colors, uh, and then I just hit my primaries button. 
So I'm going to measure red. Now, a red with its low wavelength is quite difficult for the probe to read, so it takes a little bit longer. Green and blue being more similar to uh, the, the luminance values are quicker, so the probe works very much like our eye does. It tends to take more value in. All right. Oh, no, we'll do a white. Do we have a white here? We have to jump over a couple because this is our saturation graph. There's our white. And we want black. Oops, we jumped out. Uh, windows, grayscale, first one's black. Um, it's a bit hard to tell when that's finished measuring. However, we can look at the graph pretty much straight away. Oh, there it is. We put our black point there, which will be the last thing, 0% grey. So we can see the triangle is actually not too bad, right? Like, um, it, although, I mean, if we looked at our um, measures and we went to our colours, we can see that our delta is quite shocking. Uh, we've got red is way off, uh, green and blue are, are better. Um, however, we're still, you know, nowhere near our delta E of 2 that we want. And again, if this was a broadcast monitor or a high-end OLED, I would absolutely expect that there would be controls available to me to get that number down low. But because we're on my super crummy El Cheapo uh, domestic television, I don't have those options. I don't know what the secret menus are to get in the RGB controls. I wish I did. Um, there's almost zero documentation for this particular model on the internet, and that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, a lot of the cheapy ones just never really that popular, um, and the manual that came with it was useless. So anyway, um, we're not going to use these, because uh, these, are, these are cool tools for cool devices. Uh, we're going to just eyeball it, but with some help from our little probe. So uh, we saw that, yeah, our blue point was pretty close, our green point was pretty close. They had delta E's of whatever, 4, 5, 6-ish, uh, and our red point was a fair whack off, which we're seeing here. So our red point is actually being measured more into orange. It's more coming out an orange colour than a red colour, and it's sort of flaring out past the point of where we want red for this particular colour space. Uh, our white point, again, remember our white point was down here at 9300 and we shifted it back over to 6500, so that's not too bad. Our white point sort of ballpark where we want it. So we talked about saturation. What is saturation? Uh, saturation is the amount of colour at a given point. Now on this diagram we see uh, these boxes here leading out to our desired yellow point. So yellow is halfway between green and red, or I mean, not halfway linearly, this distance and this distance are different, uh, but halfway perceptually, that's, that's where we perceive as humans, halfway between green and red. Uh, and then likewise, cyan over here and magenta over here. So our saturation is how much color is in this image. Now what we want is not only our yellow point to be in the ballpark of this square, what we also want is as we step down in our saturation levels towards our white or grey point, uh, remembering again this is a three-dimensional shape uh, coming out of the screen towards us as white going into the screen away from us, uh, our darker colours. So we're seeing like a slice through that shape through the middle. Our yellow colours or any of these colours, we want them to uh, match these points here. So if we're oversaturated, we expect, for instance, our 75% yellow point to fly out and be over here somewhere. All right, so let's let's do that. Let's measure some saturations. We go back to our menu um, and we look at our saturation menu here. Um, the first color it wants to measure is red. So let's do that. Let's measure our saturations and measure red. So red 0% is this. Now, now this is a, a grey that matches the perceived brightness of pure red. Um, and there's a, a value for that. This thing doesn't show it. If you use the HDMI generator, it shows it. But let's measure that. And that wants 25%. So we'll do that. 50%. And you see these, these dots appearing down here, right? So this was our 50% measurement, and that's where we actually wanted it to be, which is pretty crazy. 75%. So this is a 75% point. And the dot appears all the way over there, so it's way off. And finally, 
which will be this, it'll line up to that red dot because that's red. We measured that already. Rightio, so these are our red saturations. Now, we can see two things straight away. Number one is that this line doesn't follow the desired line. Um, and that is a, uh, we talk about um, hue, saturation and value in the HSV color space. So our saturation is, is this what we're measuring here? The, the um, distance away from the white point in the middle and how far out that goes. Uh, the value is the uh, lightness or darkness of it on the gray scale. So that's the z-axis of this picture, which we can't see here. Um, but the hue is as if we, this whole triangle, if we put a, a pin in the middle here at D65 and we spun the triangle, either clockwise or, uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise, um, we would see the hue change. And so our reds, not only are they well oversaturated, they're also too far into the yellow range. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and measure all the saturations of all the colours, and I'll quick cut to the end of that so you don't have to be bored by it. Alrighty, so I have done all my saturation levels. A couple of things of note. Um, cyan was terrible, absolutely terrible. Uh, Magenta was almost on the money, which was kind of cool. Um, interesting to know. I mean, my red wasn't too bad, I guess, and my, my blue is bad, but not... Awful, awful, but magenta was almost bang on the money, which was great. Uh, cyan was terrible. Cyan was almost, so this was should have been the 50% point, sorry, this should have been the 50% here, this box is where I was aiming for, and that was the actual measure. My measure was at 75%, so my cyans were awful. Uh, my 75% cyan and my 100% cyan are almost identical. Um, so we see that we're starting to crush colours here. There should, there should be this sort of uh, gulf of difference between those two measures and there was only this tiny little gulf. So by oversaturating the picture we're pushing mid-range colors out into the extreme range uh, and we lose a lot of detail in those colors. So an oversaturated picture, while a lot of people will tell you, oh yeah I, I like to uh, have a nice you know high saturation level, it does destroy the color accuracy of what we're, we're looking at. Um, so uh, a lot of televisions have a very basic feature like this one where we just have a color option. Um, and this color option is, is literally our saturation, how much color we blast out on every, any given channel. Uh, so I'm going to drop my color level down to about 40, I think, uh, and then I'm gonna re-measure, and I'll quick cut to that, and we'll see, see where we land. So I've just done the red channel, uh, but already we see that these values here are coming a lot closer to their boxes. This 75% value is way out here. Let's just drop back in here, which is really nice. Uh, so we'll continue on. Right, so we're just at cyan here. This was our 75% cyan before, which is all the way out here. Uh, and this is where we wanted it to be. Uh, so let's measure the new 75% with our new color setting toned down a bit. Let's see where that lands. So still not perfect, but you know dramatically better. We were way off before. So we've we've rerun our saturation tests for all of our primary and secondary colors. Um, for some of them, things got a lot better. Uh, yellow was this 75% point here. Uh, it was way, way out, way out. It was up here somewhere. Um, so we've pulled that in closer. Still not close enough to our 75% point to be good and accurate. And remember, I've spoken about this before. This this uh, yellow uh, red area here, as you sort of dive into the darker shades of that, you start to go through the sort of the gamut of human skin tone. All sits within this range here. So having these colors accurate is nice if you're watching movies and DVDs and things like that. If, uh, if you're just playing, especially retro games, probably not that important um, compared to some other colors. Um, particularly in retro gaming, the reds and blues, the full saturations of reds and blues are what bother me. Um, if you're playing a bit of, uh, you know, I'll show some games later on. Um, one called Action Fighter that I like to play uh, where there's a lot of blue background. And having that really oversaturated blue is just really, really hard on the eyes. Um, however, one thing to note is that while almost everything is oversaturated here in this graph, my magentas are not. My magentas are now 
undersaturated, uh, not substantially, only a little bit. Um, however, if I'm going to pull back on all my saturation, my magenta is going to suffer. So similar to um, some of the past videos I made where we got to a point where we had to make a decision, we had to say, well, are we willing to sacrifice accuracy on one component uh, in order to benefit another component? Uh, for this particular example, I am not. I'm, I'm happy to just leave it there. Uh, I don't want my magentas heading closer to greys and losing their colour values. Um, at the same time, as oversaturated as these other colours are, they're, they're not awful, awful. Uh, certainly not anywhere near as awful as they were before we started fiddling with these values. Um, so we can, you know, quick look across all the other measures once again. Our luminance graph, remember these values uh, were way out. They were, you know, our um, our blue was off the charts and now we see our blues actually come in line a bit, which is kind of cool. Uh, with all the fiddling that we've done, our blue and red are almost identical. Our green is still high out, so this, this image that we're looking at is a little too green. Um, but that's uh, better than it was, certainly. Um, let's have a look at our gamma graph. Uh, still not really happy with this. I think there's more fiddling I can do in the uh, brightness and contrast settings. But ultimately, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll be um, fairly honest, this TV does have pretty terrible gamma. Um, and, but again, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. I still love it. I still love this giant chunky CRT. Uh, my RGB levels. So these aren't too bad. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, certainly not a... A delta E <laughs> that I'm happy with if I was looking at a PVM. Uh, and this is why we use PVMs, kids, because they're nice to look at. Uh, but, you know, a fairly flat line across here, which isn't too bad. You know, it's not, not as spiky as it was. Uh, a colour temperature. Now, I mentioned before that my uh, my colour temperature at the high end here was too low. It was sitting sort of way down at 63. With this uh, filling that we've done with our, our saturation levels, we notice that because we've brought the extreme ends of the reds and the blues into alignment more, we've just got a little bit too much of the green. So the green will definitely push our 100% into the uh, into a, a different space. But we notice that these are a lot better. Our dark colors, not so much. They're sitting a little bit cool. Uh, that's okay. Um, really, honestly, from sort of 30 to 80% is where most of our colors sit. Uh, and that's not terrible, not great, not PVM great, not uh, expensive OLED great, but certainly not terrible. Um, yeah, and then obviously we had our, our CIE diagram showing us what we've uh, what we've got across a whole bunch of different colours. Um, now there is a function in here called a colour checker. I won't go into that now, uh, but you can do it's part of either full tilt boogie or part of the uh, colour checkers. Uh, it'll go and test a whole bunch of random colours. So you see these little squares here. There's uh, if I can get out of that menu, some of these squares will tell you. So that's light skin, that's dark skin, and again, uh, this isn't. Uh, remember, this is a three-dimensional shape, so this light skin will actually sit uh, closer to us on the z-axis, and this dark skin further away from us on the z-axis um, in our 3D shape. But again, so you know, this this range of colours, our yellows and our reds, getting that accurate is nice if you want to watch uh, movies really really important i think to get skin tones right above all else because generally when we're watching movies we're looking at people um, and we're as humans we're very familiar with people and we're very familiar with looking at uh, faces um, so it's very important i think uh, when i when i do work for film studios that i always try and get these skin tones bang on the money more than other things uh, again, when I'm playing my old video games, it's these high saturation levels that tend to appear a lot more in my old video games that I care about. So, um, you know, there, there's an argument for getting things 100% across all boxes. Absolutely, totally agree with that. Again, especially if your TV allows it. If you've got a big expensive OLED, you can do that. You've got so many controls on that thing, it's crazy. Um, and you can get every circle in every box. Um, you know, horses for courses, the, the TV that I'm using here is mostly for my old video games so that's all i really care about anyway so i'll probably leave the calibration part of it there for this screen uh oh there's uh, one more thing i will talk about actually um what i can show you is, is one more feature that is inherent to uh, ntsc only um, and if i go into my picture options here I've got this tint setting now that disappears if i look at um component video uh, YPBPR video, if I look at RGB, if I look at PAL, which has got a, a higher frequency encoding rate, 
uh, that tint doesn't happen. So this is correcting for NTSC tint error, which is an error that happened because of the way that NTSC video is encoded, um, where you get issues on certain colors, uh, particularly like across that, uh, uh, the, the secondaries, um, I notice. So what I can do is, I, can, I guess I can demonstrate that. If I just take my primaries and secondary values, which I've already done, you can see yellow's off, it sort of swung over uh, clockwise a bit too far, magenta's pretty much bang on the money, and cyan's off a bit. If I fiddle with the tint value, we'll see these values shift around. Um, so I might do that. I'll set the tint up a bit. I might set it to, um, I think I had it, when I last fiddled around with this, I had it to about four. So I'll leave it there just as my demonstration point, and I'll do my just my primaries and secondaries. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna measure these outer values, these six values around the outside of this triangle. And I'll cut to that. All right, so I've I've modified that tint, and what happened was that uh, my yellow value. This is my new measured yellow value. This is my old measured yellow value. Uh, you can see that that's come closer in alignment. So it's it's fixed yellow at the very least. Uh, red shifted up a little bit. Uh, again, because I guess the, the yellow tint pushed that edge of the triangle out, we saw red come up ever so slightly, not a huge amount. Green unchanged, blue unchanged. Cyan uh, shifted, I guess, worse. So this was my old cyan value and now my new one. So now my cyans are too blue. Uh, and this is my desired magenta point. This was my old measure here. Uh, and it shot out all the way over here. It's become redder. So as much as my yellow has been fixed nicely, um, it was swinging too far out towards red, uh, making my yellows probably appear darker than they should. They probably um, they won't sort of appear so green. Um, they would have you know, come more into this orangey sort of color. Uh, now my magentas are wrong. So again, back to this old uh, issue of what do we do? Um, do, we, do we bother? Um, I could, probably from here I would fiddle a bit. I, I chose uh, four as my value um, to shift the tint by. Uh, likewise, if I shift tint in the other direction, it's just gonna swing everything back the other way. So it's gonna swing my magenta back this way. It's gonna swing my cyan back this way. It's gonna swing my yellow um, back this way. Um, in this sort of clockwise direction. Um, if, I, if I'm in a negative tint, if I'm in a positive tint, it flips it anti-clockwise. Again, imagine you put a pin in the middle and spin this whole triangle around, or spin your values around either way. Um, so something to consider. Again, this is only relevant to composite video NTSC encoded. Um, so if you're a PAL user, you won't see this. If you're an RGB VGA user, you won't see this. If you're a uh, component video user, you won't see any of this. So um, I won't harp on it too much. Uh, I'm probably just going to set those values back to default where they were because um, my, my colors are uh, not too bad, um, you know, maybe a little bit higher or lower. Again, it doesn't really affect me because I don't play video games through my, um, my composite input. I tend to play through my component input on this particular television off my mister. Um, but anyway, that's, that's an example. Again, that won't uh, happen if you see use other video standards. So just a note for the NTSC users, um, you know, uh, particularly consoles that don't have any other options like the Nintendo NES without modding at least. Um, anyway, we'll leave that there. I'm just going to uh, do the final check, which everybody should always do, which is to actually play some video games. Um, you know, whatever you're calibrating to, Go and do that thing after you've calibrated. Alrighty, so I'm on my Mister, <clears throat> my favourite way to play my old games at the moment. Um, if you haven't jumped on the Mister bandwagon as a, a retro gamer, you are missing out, in my very humble opinion. Um, so I'm going to look at a couple of games that I'm very familiar with. So Action Fighter, uh, this is one that I uh, used to love as a kid, and that blue screen there would burn your retinas clean out of your skull um, if you weren't ready for it. Turn my audio up. Uh, put in the old Doki Pen cheat. So 
So this game starts you off uh, as a motorcycle, unless you put in Doki Pen. And then you start off as the uh, car straight away. Grab all the letters and you turn into the aeroplane. And of course, Doki Pen cheats. There's a Sega truck if you want to get a power up. Sega, I should say. Sorry, terrible accent at play. And again, this part of the game, we get into some a lot of blues, a lot of reds. We get these, these deep primary colours. Uh, one of the reasons I love the Sega Master System is the uh, these bright colours. Um, audio is pretty terrible, not going to lie. The pulse generator sound, pulse sound, pretty awful compared to FM consoles. But anyway, um, good example, sorry Mr. Carr, good example of some bright blues there. Let's try some others. Colours looking pretty good in this. Chun Li's orange dress bug is there. A little bit oversaturated still. I don't know what any of the key bindings are on this. I haven't set this up for this controller. Anyway. Those colours look pretty good. The blue on Chun Li's, uh, particularly around her head, would usually oversaturate previously. Um, and you get that bleeding into other colours on this particular screen, so that's looking a bit better now. Contrast-wise, not too bad. Um, the the black colours in the background here are probably a little bit over the top, but they're okay. But for the rest of it, it's looking okay, especially for this screen, which is um, can be pretty awful at times when it wants to be. All right, an old favourite. Hope everyone's playing Streets of Rage 4 at the moment, because that is a great game. But this is my uh, my other favourite, which is Streets of Rage 2. Nobody likes Streets of Rage 3. Again, colours are good here. Um, my reds, especially on the gloves and Blazer's outfit, would really blow out. Um, the gold and the stars look pretty terrible. Um, and blues especially, they, they were pretty shocking, so good game to play because it, it's there's some good contrast bits um oops where's my there's my attack button oops that's special how have i mapped this i don't know i don't have jump oh well, whatever let's do without jump again i don't you normally use this controller i usually use my uh my sega satin controller uh on this just using my SNES one at the moment, which has got some weird mappings. But anyway, uh, especially these colours up here, uh, great to look at. Again, you know, high contrast between the blacks and the colours. Um, the dark alleyways down here. Um, uh, these could be a little bit darker, I guess. I could probably just drop that brightness down a little bit, I suspect. Um, grab my controller. I just drop that brightness down just a few. Probably look a little bit better. Uh, and again, that's that's a bit subjective because I am sitting here in a dark room. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's looking pretty spectacular at the moment. Um, and of course, uh, we couldn't finish off video without the greatest video game of all time. Made in a great year. Again, an excellent video to show off, and, and I mean, forgive my rubbish camera, please, um, but to the eye, this looks great. Um, these reds here in these tidal colours would come out um, way too oversaturated. They'd, they'd bleed in the background pretty horribly. The Super Metroid logo um, should have a good 
blend from uh, red through the oranges to yellow. So you'll see a lot of displays where that will come out very red, um, almost as if the logo itself was red and it's not. Uh, it's a pretty good giveaway. I can see my uh, a little bit too much green in the image, which certainly the probe picked up and suggested. Um, especially my greys, I can see, uh, I mean, these are a little, a tiny bit on the green level. Um, but certainly I am really happy with that. Those colours look far more accurate, much closer to what my uh, PVM or my other displays that I've calibrated previously would look at. Um, much happier with how that's turned out with a little bit of tweaking. Uh, this is quite a dark game. So this could do with a bit of uh, bumping up of the brightness, which I just turned down only a second ago. I'm not going to fiddle with the contrast. Contrast will uh, brighten up the bright areas. I just want the dark areas to come up a little bit. Um, this is great here. Samus is in these areas uh, with that suit. It should be very orange and not uh, too red or too yellow. Same goes for this area here too. The blues and whites look good, very clear. All right, so I'm super happy with that. I'm gonna leave that display as is. Uh, and I'm gonna use that with this calibration. Hopefully that's um, explained the things you can do even if you don't have a lot of options at your disposal. Um, and it's also demonstrated the DVD method instead of the um, having some sort of automatic picture generator sent up to it. Um, I will touch in a later video on the work that I'm doing to do a proper Rec 601 calibration DVD set that you can use from a regular DVD player. Uh, whether that's a PlayStation 3 like I was doing today, a Blu-ray player, an actual DVD player, a PlayStation 2 which will play DVD, uh, modded Wii, a few other options out there as well. Um, so anyway, I hope that's um, been informative and I hope that's given everybody some extra options to make their displays look good. Uh, happy gaming!